All right, Bodhi. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. All right. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. David Coyle, who joined the Clemson faculty in 2018 with a focus on forest health and invasive species extension. Prior to Clemson, he created and directed the Southern Forest <laughs> Invasive Species Program, which provides education and training to forestry professionals across the southeastern United States. Dr. Coyle uses various forms of communication, including social media, traditional writing, and in-person visits to help educate people about forest health, invasive species, and forest management. He's a member of the Society of American Foresters and the Entomological Society of America. He serves as the president-elect of the American Invasive Species Alliance. He is the co-director of Go Forest, an organization which promotes proactive rather than reactive forest best management. Welcome, Dave. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bodhi, and thanks everyone for having me on here today. Let's go ahead and get my screen up here. All right. So this morning we're going to talk about insect and fungal pests in urban trees. And the first thing to remember about urban trees is that they deal with a lot of stuff. Where are we here? So you've got trees planted in this urban area and they look all happy and green, but they're dealing with a lot of things. They've got precipitation coming, whether that's rain, whether that's ice, they could be flooded depending on how they're planted, uh, if they're in containers or if they're not in containers. They've got wind, you've got wind sometimes really whips between buildings in, in urban areas. Pollution, we're all aware of, uh, there's differences in the air quality in an urban setting versus in a natural setting. And there's lots of pests. There's pests everywhere. Where there is a tree to eat, a pest will find it. So that's something to remember. And then we have humans, which I've heard some people say humans are the biggest threat to urban trees that we have, is human activity and, and the lack of care by some humans. But these are all things uh, trees deal with, as well as temperature. And that's something that we may or may not think about. But temperatures are quite different in the urban area uh, compared to in a natural area. And here we have a heat map, a surface temperature map. And this is a Raleigh. This was done by uh, Adam Dale and Steve Frank up at NC State. But you can see this is a part of Raleigh. And these red areas are parts of the urban, uh, urban area there. Uh, trees are planted here. So you might have trees planted in these bluer areas, which are cooler. But then again, you've got trees planted in those hot, redder areas. So they have a, a more often warmer temperature than their counterparts out in the natural places. And this is important for a number of reasons. There have been a number of very smart people who've done a lot of research, so I'll try to summarize it real quick right here. But the take home points are, when there are warmer nights, you're gonna have more water loss from leaves and trees. And you have this because, again, in that urban area, it just doesn't get as cool at night. So you've got more water loss from leaves overnight, when it's hot, photosynthesis decreases. And remember for trees, photosynthesis is what helps make food and, and make their energy. So if they can't make as much of that, you're always at a little bit of an energy deficit. So when it's hot, they can't make as much food. And then also when it's hot, the tree can't store as much energy. So a tree makes food in the leaves and sends it down to the roots where it stores it in those large feeder roots as uh, carbohydrates. When it's hot, the tree basically just can't make and store as much energy. So what that results in is this perpetually stressed tree. You've got a tree that's always a little bit warmer than it's probably comfortable being. It's not quite making up as much food as it would like. It's not storing as much food as it would like. And on top of that, it's probably losing more water than normal because of that warmer environment. So we've got this very stressed tree and I want you to remember that for a minute. Because I'll do a quick insect biology talk. Insect biology 101. Insects are ectotherms, and that simply means their temperature is what the outside temperature is. Okay, so if the outside temperature here is on the bottom and you've got their body temperature here, it goes up at the exact same rate. So when it's really, really warm, insects' body temperatures are really, really warm, and when that happens, they grow faster and they grow bigger. And so here's a study from 
an old professor of mine, Rick Lindroth, will just have a very hungry caterpillar come in here. So you've got three very hungry little caterpillars, each of these at different temperatures. This top, uh, the top box there, you've got a high temperature of 66, a low of 61, all the way down to the bottom where they get up to 77 during the day and 72 at night. That top box, the caterpillar will eventually get full size. Uh, it takes a little bit longer. You can see on the bottom, it takes about seven weeks to reach full size. As you increase that temperature, that caterpillar is going to get larger faster. And then as you get all the way to the bottom, it gets even bigger and it gets even faster. So it can get twice the size in half the time. And that just means it's eating more and more foliage compared to that hungry caterpillar up on top. This is pretty common. We see this in not just caterpillars in the urban environment, but we also see it in sucking insects and other chewing insects as well. So when you've got this environment that is warmer, you're gonna have bugs growing faster and eating more. We also have fungus in urban environments too, and I'm not gonna make you look through all this, these graphs, but basically this is your general pattern of fungal growth as it gets warmer. What this says is when it's too cold, nothing grows. And that's what you see on the lower left part of that red line. When it's too cold, nothing's gonna grow. And on the far right where it crashes over there, you can see that when it's too hot, fungus dies, okay? But by and large, you're gonna get, especially in this middle part of that graph, you will get a lot of fungal growth as the temperature rises. So for the trees, what does this mean? Most of these urban trees are gonna be stressed both physically and physiologically, okay? You've got the physical stress of, of being in that urban environment, of humans, of the occasional crash from a, you know, a wayward car, that type of thing. Also, most of these tree pests only impact stressed trees. Now there's very few exceptions. I can think of about two or three insect and fungal pests, and we'll talk about a couple of them, that impact healthy trees. Okay, by and large, most of the insects we see in urban tree situations are secondary insects. They're not aggressive. They're only there because that tree is weak enough to allow them there and to not have enough defenses to keep them out. So again, the urban tree environment basically makes this perfect storm of stress factors. And that's what we'll talk about a little bit today. So first we'll go through a few defoliating insects that we find throughout the Southeast. And we'll talk about how those, how those react. So first we'll talk about the forest tent caterpillar. This is uh, unfortunately named. There's no tent associated with the forest tent caterpillar. Entomologists are not always the best at, at coming up with clever names, but it is a very native, uh, it's a native insect. We find it all over the US and Canada. There's one generation per year and it's, it eats so many things, it's pretty much easier to say what they don't eat, which is red maple, sycamore, and conifers. Everything else is on the table. The life cycle is very typical of a lot of these lepidopterans we'll talk about. They emerge, uh, hatch from their eggs in the spring and then they start feeding on foliage. Uh, they get larger and larger. The, the larger caterpillars can be over two inches long in some cases. They make a cocoon, they come out as a moth and this little brown moth, they will mate and they will lay eggs and they lay these eggs around the twigs and they spend the winter as the eggs on twigs. So sometimes if you've got a tree that you knew, you know had these caterpillars on the previous summer, you can find these egg masses and clip them off in the spring and that will help reduce those populations. Now the tent caterpillar outbreaks are cyclical, meaning they kind of go up and go down and we don't always know what makes them go up and down. They are not something that's gonna kill that tree, uh, not very often anyway, but these repeated defoliations are not good. Again, they're another stressor to that tree. And then this picture, you can see a couple trees in the middle of summer that are completely defoliated from forest tent caterpillars. And in addition to the the foliation they do, they're a complete nuisance when they have those high populations. You can see this house, you can see all those white things underneath the siding, those are all forest tent caterpillar cocoons. So they had an outbreak around this house, for whatever reason they migrated over to that house and they all spun cocoons and stuck them to the side of that house. So it can be a big nuisance, especially when those older caterpillars, when they're done feeding, they might, again, they migrate a little bit, they sort of wander and try to find a place to make a cocoon and they can get you know, all over the roads, all over the cars, all over the sidewalks, that type of thing. 
So next we have the eastern tent caterpillar, which does have the tent. And this is one that is very commonly seen early in the spring. It's the one that makes those nests right in the branch crotches, often of cherry trees and that type of thing. Again, very similar life cycle to the forest tent caterpillar. It hatches in the spring, they feed. Again, you see those tents and the tents get bigger as the caterpillars get bigger. So they start out with a pretty small tent and then they keep increasing it in size and they hide in there uh, when they're not feeding. Again, a little brown moth that mates and then they lay those eggs on the twigs and the, twig, the eggs over winter on the twigs. Another way you can control these, if you've got a little tree that had tent caterpillars, go out there the next, you know, early the next spring. And if you can find those egg masses, you can clip them off and remove them. And that should take care of things. Now, how do you tell these two apart? Uh, it's actually not all that difficult. The Eastern tent caterpillar has a white line going down the back of it. And the forest tent caterpillar has what looks like white boot prints going down the back of it. And depending on your uh, perspective, it, um, if you look at it the other way, it kind of looks like a row of little white penguins too. So it just depends, but you've got a white line with the Eastern tent and either boot prints or penguins with the forest tent. Now, what do we do about tent caterpillars? Well, one option is to do nothing. Uh, a lot of times natural enemies will take care of the populations. That's other insects, that's birds, that might be mice eating the pupae, any of that stuff. You can treat with an insecticide. And if you're gonna use an insecticide, there are um, you know, broad spectrum insecticides, but for Lepidoptera, you can use an insecticide with BC, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, those will kill only the lepidopteran, so it won't harm the spiders, the beetles, or any of that type of thing. And for single tree controls, we talked a little bit. If you see that egg mass, you can see in the lower right, you can see an egg mass there. You can just clip that off of the pruner. Uh, you could also band the tree, put a tree band on there, um, and, and those other things if you really need to treat that tree. But again, chemical treatment is rarely needed for these things. Next, we'll talk about the canker worm. These are also known as loopers or inchworms. So we've probably all see these again, one generation a year, native to North America, and they eat a lot of stuff as well. Ash, bass, basswood, beech, birch, dogwood, etc., etc. And in some areas, they're a really big nuisance. Uh, Fairfax, Virginia, Charlotte, North Carolina have had canker worm infestations for years at this point. No one really knows why, but they really like those areas. Life cycle, again, very similar. Overwinter is eggs. They look a little different, but you can still see them on the twig there. Uh, eggs hatch in early spring and feed, and then they pupate down in the soil. When they emerge in the fall, hence the fall canker worm, the males are the only ones with wings. So the females don't have wings. They climb up in the tree and they give off a pheromone, a chemical. It attracts the male to them. The males fly in, they mate, and then the female will often lay eggs on the same tree she fed on as a larva. Management is very similar to the other uh, tent caterpillars. We monitor populations. There's BT sprays, Bacillus thuringiensis, Kirstaki is the technical uh, term of it. Uh, a lot of natural enemies out there. There's those big green caterpillar hunter beetles, there's birds, and then sticky bands are often used. You can see these a lot of times if you drive up through Charlotte in the early spring, they've got sticky bands everywhere. So one thing to consider when you've got fall canker worms and some of these other uh, tree insects is trees normally not eaten can be eaten more in the presence of a preferred host. So we'll look at this graph. Each of these bars is dogwood. So you've got dogwood in three different places. Where you have dogwood alone on the right, it doesn't eat too much of it because it's got a very small bar there where you've got dogwood with a pine next to a pine. Again, it won't eat a whole lot, but if you've got a dogwood next to an oak tree, it's going to eat a whole lot of that dogwood, and that's because it's already eating a whole lot of that oak. So if you've got a host that it, that it really, really likes, like an oak, and there's something it kind of likes next to it, it'll eat more of that kind of likes tree versus if that tree was somewhere else. So we need to be aware when we're in situations to look at not only the tree that's getting impacted right now, but what's next to it to see if we need to worry about possible uh, preventative treatments on those trees as well. Now the gypsy moth is something we often see, you know, this is in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky. We see a lot. We occasionally get one here and there in the rest of the Southeast, but those are our main states for this one. 
This one is not native, it's native to Europe. It was brought over to Medford, Massachusetts in 1868 on purpose by this guy, Leopold Trugolo. Uh, he wanted to breed the gypsy moth with silk moths and his goal was to make this booming silk industry and he picked the silk moth because they of course make the silk that was worth something for clothes and all that. And he picked gypsy moth because they feed on, you know, think over 500 species of woody plants. So his goal was I will make this caterpillar that eats everything and produces a lot of silk and I will be rich and famous. What he didn't realize or didn't look up is that gypsy moth and silk moths are not even in the same family, which is, means they can't mate, which is basically like trying to have these two things mate and have a baby. It's simply not going to work. So he did his thing, some larvae escaped. He went back to France and left us with these iconic pictures of people up in the trees trying to remove gypsy moth uh, egg masses and pupae. Clearly there were not OSHA standards back then like we have now, but this is the situation we have. And since then it's exploded all over much of uh, Eastern North America. The life stages for the gypsy moth, you've got these little caterpillars will hatch out of that mass. They will start feeding. They've got six rows of red spots and five rows of blue spots on their body. So they've got very distinct red and blue spots. It's a good way to tell those apart. Uh, the pupae will, you know, the brown pupae, the cocoons are pretty loose. They're not a really big thick cocoon. It's just kind of a bunch of hairs put around in there. And then the males are the brown moth and the females are the white moth. So how do we manage gypsy moth? Well, there's a, there's a number of things that we do, especially the federal government. There's a virus that has been uh, made into a formulation that can be sprayed called gyp check that will infect those populations and help decrease them. There's a natural fungus called entomophaga, which is out there. Uh, we have very good data that shows when that fungus gets in high populations, it can really help reduce uh, the population of gypsy moth. There's also mating disruption that has been made into these little capsule capsules. Uh, again, the females do not fly, so they just crawl up a tree. They put out their pheromone and the males fly to them. What these little mating capsules do is they contain the female pheromone, and so they will spread them all over the forest, which basically means when a male moth comes, he cannot tell where a female is because it just smells like ladies everywhere, and he gets confused, and they can't find each other to actually mate. It actually works quite well, and it's non-chemical. And then there are many chemical pesticide controls. Pretty much anything that controls, uh, you know, any type of leptopterin works on gypsy moth. There's also a lot of natural enemies. The mice, field mice love to eat the pupae. There's parasitic flies. There's aggressive uh, large beetles. Those big caterpillar hunter beetles are an inch, inch and a half long. And then birds will eat a lot of those uh, caterpillars as well. So there's a very healthy natural enemy component out there there for these things. Now we'll switch gears a little bit to the emerald ash borer. This is something I hope we have all heard of. So far to our estimate has killed millions of trees and cost billions of dollars in urban areas and natural areas in North America. Here's our current range map. You can see it is pretty much all over Eastern North America. We're not sure what Mississippi is doing, but it must be some kind of clean living because they have yet to find emerald ash borer there. But it is pretty much all over, uh, you know, most of the rest of the, the region. Now EAB is a little green beetle. People may get confused because to a lot of people, any little green beetle looks like emerald ash borer. So here's some of the things that can be confused with it. Not to be confused, the AB is in that red box. The life cycle for emerald ash borer, the adults come out of the tree in, you know, as early as late March, and they always make a perfect D-shaped exit hole. So remember D for Dave. D-shaped exit holes that the emerald ash borers make. Uh, they can survive without food if they need to, but often uh, they'll come out just around the time the leaves will start uh, leafing out for the tree. The adults feed a little bit on the foliage. That's not really the damage. They don't eat all that much, but they feed, they mate, and then they lay eggs. And to be honest, none of us will probably ever see an egg. They're tiny little things wedged down in there. But you may see one of these larvae, and this is what does the damage on those trees. That larva gets in there and it consumes the phloem of the tree and basically helps that tree starve. You can have very extensive gallery making in these trees. Um, you know, it just consumes all the phloem and the tree has no chance of living at that point. And then those uh, larvae will turn into pupae, uh, 
underneath the bark and emerge again the following spring. What do we look for for emerald ash borer? Well, it starts with an ash tree. They feed only on ash trees, but any species of fraxinus, so white ash, green ash, blue ash, black ash, pumpkin ash, whatever it may be, if it's an ash tree, uh, it is susceptible to EAB. So if you start seeing a declining or thinning crown, that's a key. Uh, if you start seeing these epicormic shoots, that is also a big key. Now, once you see these epicormic shoots, there's pretty much just one prune you need to make to take care of this tree and that's right at the ground line because this tree is not going to come back. Once it gets to this point and it's got all those epicormic shoot, sprout, uh, sprouts there, that is a tree's last gasp effort at life and it rarely if ever works. So by this point that tree is a goner. If you were to go up to it you would probably see D-shaped holes up and down the stem. You would peel that bark and you'd be able to see those galleries in there as well. You've got cracked and swollen bark, and a lot of times underneath that little crack, you'll be able to see those galleries going back and forth. Again, the D-shaped holes and the winding galleries under the bark. Another good takeaway or, or giveaway is woodpecker activity, because woodpeckers love to eat these larvae, and they are also, uh, they're often very good at figuring out where EAB is before we can figure it out. So if you've got an ash tree that all of a sudden looks extremely uh, you know, attractive to woodpeckers, you might want to take a closer look at that because that probably means something is inside there. And then there's also this ash blonding, and this happens when, again, woodpeckers go and in their, their efforts to get those larvae, they chip away the outer part of the bark. So the, the, we call it blonde, it's a much lighter brownish color, is actually kind of the middle of the bark, so the outside has been flaked off by the woodpeckers and uh, they were going after the larvae inside. So that's what to look for. When do you look for it? Uh, the National Phenology Network has a really, really great emerald ash borer projection page, uh, and they make these maps. They make these maps color-coded by when EAB should be out there. In this case, the bright yellow is when the adults would be emerging. Now, the bright yellow right now is a little farther south than any EAB is, so we don't have any emergence yet. But those two shades of green, we expect adults in a couple weeks in some of these places, especially when you're, you know, getting towards Atlanta there. So this is a good one to help follow when to expect things and, and where it is based on the degree days. Now, what can we do about the emerald ash borer? Unfortunately, there's, there's not a lot we can do. We monitor populations to see where it is. The big thing we try to, you know, part on people is don't move firewood. Just because you have a dead ash tree does not mean you should cut that tree up and take the wood over to deer camp or over to grandma's for Thanksgiving or anywhere. We've got to keep that dead firewood where we have it. Uh, this is how non-native pests get moved, not just emerald ash borer, but some other things we'll talk about quickly. Moving firewood is the number one way things get moved around once they're in here. So we really want to get people to not take that stuff everywhere. Now you can save an ash tree, okay? An early invention, intervention is absolutely critical. We generally say if you have less than 30% canopy thinning, you've got a shot at saving that tree. If there's over 30% of the canopy lost, it's, it's not good odds, not good odds. Again, looking on this picture on the far right, sorry, on the far left, you've got a tree that's only 10% thin. There's a really good chance of saving that one. Uh, the middle one, 10 to 30%, you probably can save it. But once it gets over there to that tree on the right, there's an out, not a lot you can do. Preventative-wise, when EAB is 15 miles away, that's when we recommend starting treatments. And there's a number of treatments you can use for your tree. There are basal drenches, trunk injections, trunk sprays, Four main chemicals we use, imidacloprid, dinotefuran, emamectin, benzoate, and azadiractin. These have different trade names. Uh, there's financial and logistical limitations for all of them. But the key is, if you have a tree in the wake of emerald ash borer, <coughs> excuse me, you can save it. it. Can be saved. Now, what is the value of a tree? Okay, and you have gotta remember that <clears throat> Emerald ash borer is going to kill 99.9% .9 of all untreated ash trees. So very few are going to just naturally survive on their own. And healthy trees have value. And there's a value calculator online, treebenefits.com slash calculator. 
And it's a good tool to demonstrate the economic and ecological benefits of a client's tree. Okay, for instance, what are the benefits of a 20 inch white ash in Athens, Georgia? You put that in and it spits you out this graph and it quantifies things like stormwater uh, use, air quality, property value, CO2, carbon mitigation, and savings on electricity from shading your house. So you can get, um, you can get a number, you know, in this case, it's estimated $166 a year for an ash tree of that size in Athens, Georgia. And I can tell you that it will not cost that much per year to treat a tree. You're probably looking at for something like that in Athens, you're maybe looking at on average 50 bucks a year to treat it. Uh, and you'll be treating it every two to two to three years. So trees have value and you can use this to help get at some of those hidden values and, and use that to determine whether you should save it or uh, replace it. Now we'll talk a little bit about bark beetles. Most of the ones in the southeastern U.S. are native. Uh, again, most of them attack stressed trees. The only exception we have is the southern pine beetle. And that's only when the southern pine beetle starts getting in an outbreak situation. Then it can rip through some healthy trees. But other than that, it pretty much just feeds on stress stuff. And again, these feed on phloem. Phloem is the sleeve of life in the tree. It's on the outside of that wood. The feeding consumes the phloem and then trees die from lack of nutrition. And in the southeast, we've got seven different main species here. Uh, Ips pinei and Dendroctinus valens. You're really just going to find those in the Appalachian region, but you'll find all those other ones kind of all over the place. It's got a very standard bark beetle type uh, life cycle where it attacks the tree. The tree tries to fight it off with the pitch and pitching it out. Uh, eventually, if there's enough of them, they will overcome the tree's defenses. The larvae will feed inside on the foam. They will pack those galleries with frass behind them. And frass is just a fancy entomological term for poop. So they eat on one end of them and they poop on the other and pack it behind them. Southern pine beetle makes sort of S-shaped winding galleries in the bark. That's what you can see in the lower left. And after they've done their damage and left, they leave uh, exit holes. And that you'll notice the exit holes do not have sap around them. Okay, a tree only produces sap, a pine tree produces sap when it's trying to fight off that initial infestation. Once the beetle has done its thing and left, the tree is no longer fighting, so there is no sap. So traditionally, we, a lot of times we think of southern pine beetle as something that impacts our natural forests, our national forests and private landowners. And yes, this is true. This is a very big outbreak from Texas a few years ago. But we can also see it in urban areas. Okay, southern pine beetle attacks southern pine. So loblaw pine, slash pine, uh, shortleaf pine, Virginia pine, white pine in some cases. Longleaf pine is pretty rarely uh, attacked, but it can happen. But just because you're in an urban area does not mean you are immune to southern pine beetle. And for that matter, it does not mean you're immune to ips bark beetles. These are similar to southern pine beetle in size. They're quite a bit less aggressive. And one other big difference is their gallery shape. So the galleries, again, of southern pine beetle, they wave back and forth, S for southern. Ips bark beetles, their galleries tend to go up and down on the stem. So they'll be shaped like an H or a Y or, or an I. So they're going vertical up and down. These are even less aggressive than southern pine beetles. So if there is an Ips issue, it means that tree was stressed. Maybe it's construction damage. Maybe it's uh, a drought, which is a very common thing. That's the type of thing that will start uh, these allowing nips to get into a tree. And you can see this also will affect trees both in natural and in urban landscapes. Same with the black turpentine beetle. If you see great big large pitch tubes, they might be an inch, inch and a half, you know, wide and, and long. They're very large things on the lower part of the tree. These are signs, not that you've got beetles attacking your tree, they're signs that the tree is very stressed from something and it's finally stressed enough to where the beetles are able to get into that tree. So we talked about bark beetles, we'll also talk about some ambrosia beetles. These are very similar in size. If you look under a microscope, they're much more dynamic looking. We have many different kinds in the southeast. Most of them are native, but we do have quite a few non-natives. And these attack stress trees in any environment, natural area, nursery, uh, urban environment. If there's a stress tree, an ambrosia beetle will find it. And that's because when trees become stressed, they give off certain chemicals, ethanol being one of them. 
And that is often what those ambrosia beetles cue into is ethanol. Now, we talked about bark beetles, how they feed on the phloem and they consume that live part of the tree. Ambrosia beetles are a bit different. When they find a stressed tree, they just drill into that tree. They're not feeding on that phloem. The adult will drill into that tree and make a gallery and she's got little pockets on her shoulders. They're called mycangia and they hold fungal spores. As she's eating her way into that tree, fungal spores are getting off onto the side of that gallery and then it starts growing. And you can see on the right here that dark color, that's fungus growing on the inside of that gallery. She lays her eggs and the larvae feed on the fungus. So they are not actually eating the tree itself. She's just hollowing out part of that tree so she can make a, a fungal garden and make a home. And that's all that's happening there. But as she's doing this, she makes what we call toothpicks or noodles or frass tubes. This is a dead giveaway that you have ambrosia beetles. Each one of these little things is where one adult beetle has gone into that tree. And again, as she's chewing, remember, she's not really eating, she's chewing. So it's a combination of sawdust and frass and maybe some fungal hyphae makes that stuff stick together and it's almost like you're making homemade pasta. It shoots out in a little spaghetti-like ring at the end there. These are very fragile. So, you know, if it rains, they're all going to wash off usually. But every now and again, you'll see a tree that's riddled with them and you can know right away this is ambrosia beetle damage. So one of the ambrosia beetles we deal with a lot is the black twig borer. Uh, this is native to Asia. It's extremely, extremely tiny, feeds on all sorts of stuff. Um, but what we usually see here, this is black twig borer damage. It's this flagging here. You see these little dead branch tips all over the place. It's pretty much always aesthetic and not a problem for established plants. On a rare, rare occasion, if you just transplant something, it may impact uh, that if there's high populations and sort of killing all the branches, but by and large, it's an aesthetic thing, but it happens quite a bit in urban areas and people often see it and think, what is happening in my tree? I want that to end. You can hand prune it. That's probably the easiest thing to do. You can look for that uh, damaged part and go just a little bit into the green and cut it. If you look real careful, you can see a little hole there where the beetle went in. You can see how tiny that hole is. I mean, it's the size of a, a pin almost. There's really no good chemical control because once the beetle enters that tree, remember it's in the dead wood. So it's burrowing through the wood that is not conducting any, doing any conduction. So you can't inject a tree like you could for a foam feeder. Uh, and we do have science that shows these attacks tend to be closer to the ground. And that's all that bar graph shows. But that means it can be pruned out. If you've got a client that has this type of thing, uh, again, just go to where the flagging starts, go back down into the green just a little bit. And you should be able to cut it off and then dispose of those and you'll take the beetles with you. Now here's one that is a little more difficult to deal with. This is laurel wilt and it's spread by the red bay ambrosia beetle. This is, uh, they're both native to Asia. To our best estimate, up to 300 or 300 to 500 million trees have already been killed. This is kind of a bad one. Again, very similar life cycle. You've got adults attacking the tree and then the fungus, uh, the larvae feed on the fungi inside those galleries. You get those mass attacks where you see frass tubes all over the place. And then this one, the fungus actually gets in the conductive tissue of the tree and stains that uh, wood as well. The host for laurel wilt is anything in the family Lauraceae. Lauraceae, so all the bay trees, camphor tree, sassafras, pond spice, avocado is one for those of you in the, the far south watching us. These are all hosts for laurel wilt, and you can see so far, we first detected this in 2002, right around Savannah, Georgia. It has since spread through much of the coastal plain. And look carefully, look over in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. We talked earlier about moving firewood and how that spreads things. Well, these beetles are not that good a flyer, so the reason you've got those spots over there that are completely disjunct from the rest of the stuff in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, it's because infested wood was moved over there uh, early on and unknowingly transported uh, the red band ambrosia beetle over to that part of the region, over to the Western Gulf region. So how do we manage laurel wilt? Probably the best thing to do is sanitation. If you've got a tree that is infected, you gotta cut it down, you gotta chip it up and be done with it and, and chip it up pretty fine. 
You can't use physical protection because these insects can get in anything that's a uh, half to three quarters of an inch in diameter. So you, basically you'd be putting, you know, a, a very fine trap over an entire tree. It's just not feasible. You can use some fungicides. So you can inject your tree with fungicides. Propiconazole works pretty well. Um, you have to do that every year and it's not cheap. There are insecticides that will kill the adult beetles, but you know, in a lot of these places, especially in the coastal plain, these beetles are flying pretty much year round. So you would basically be spraying probably every two weeks. And that, that to me is pretty unfeasible as well, as well as just not, not a good use of your money. So if someone really has a tree, excuse me, in their front yard that they want to save, you're in the hot zone for laurel wilt, I would recommend use a fungicide and inject it and, and do that every year. Now, another thing we have in urban areas is scales, all sorts of scale problems. And you could, you could do a week-long course on scales, so we'll just touch on it real quickly here. You've got soft scales. Uh, you know, all of these are going to excrete honeydew. You've got armored scales. You've got lecanium scales and wax scales. Now, they're basically all kind of the same thing. Uh, they have one stage that is mobile, the crawler. So after that egg hatches, the crawler walks around a little bit, finds the place it wants to eat, inserts its mouth part into the tree, into the stem, and then hunkers down for life right there. Um, that is the only point where you can use contact insecticides very well because the crawlers will get into that stuff. Uh, in some cases, you can use injectable things. Uh, in other cases, you can actually wash them off just by using uh, horticultural oils and that type of thing. But it really depends on what kind of scale you have. So when you've got a scale issue, the first thing you want to do, figure out what scale you've got and kind of go from there. Now, one of these we will talk about is a crepe myrtle bark scale. This is a non-native one, native to Asia. And the reason this one seems to be a little bit more of a problem is because they, they spit out so much honeydew. So as an aphid feeds or a scale feeds, it's sucking fluid into its body, taking what it needs, and it's ex ejecting basically sugar water out the back end. That drips down the plant, and because it's sweet and has those sugars, there are molds that is going to grow. A mold and a fungus will grow on that stuff, and that's what our uh, sooty mold is. It's just a fungus growing on sugary secretions. So you get this fungus, this sooty mold, and it has a very, very unappealing look to it. Some of these uh, crepe myrtle bark scale cases can be so dire that there's enough scales on there where they actually stunt the growth of the plant and, you know, cause some dieback. Here we've got a picture of a treated with an untreated tree. I think this was over in Texas, if I remember right. But you can see the tree that has been treated is fuller and it's got much, you know, way more flowers than the one on the right, which looks a little bit smaller. And, you know, they're right next to each other. They should both have flowers at this point. It's got much less flowers. So the scale, you know, crepe myrtle bark scale is probably not going to kill anything, but it's definitely going to stunt it and going to make it uh, very unappealing because of all that black sooty mold that's going to get everywhere. So far, here's where your crepe myrtle bark scales are found. Most of the issue is in the western Gulf region, but we do have the occasional spot popping up in the eastern part of the uh, region as well. So it's one of those things to be aware of. It looks very white and if you've got white scales on a crepe myrtle and you take and you poke one with the tip of your pen or something and it oozes a bright pink liquid, that is a giveaway. So crepe myrtle bark, pails, crepe myrtle bark scales uh, ooze pink. So if you squeeze one it pops, it's got pink, that's probably a crepe myrtle bark scale. A lot of those other scales, when you pop them, it's not going to be that bright pink color. It's going to be more of a, a whitish or opaque or something to that, to that nature. So again, scale management. What should you do and should you control the scale? In some cases, probably no, but uh, there are systemic insecticides that work, some neonic, some acephate. Horticultural oil works as well as as insecticidal soap. Uh, in some cases, you can just simply physically wash the stuff off of there. When you've got the crawlers, the contact insecticides work. So to use these effectively, you've got to know the life cycle and the life stage of the insect. You've got to know at what point they are actually crawling. And in the case of the crepe myrtle bark scale, 
Uh, Dr. Vaife is at Texas A&M Overton is doing a whole bunch of work on that, and he's developing some of these uh, degree day models so we can then predict based on the temperatures, this is when they'll be crawling, this is when you can spray to try to take care of them. And there's also some growth regulators that can be used. Long story short, it really depends on the scale insect. So you have to figure out first, what do I have? Is it an armored scale, soft scale? What is it? And then from there, you kind of move on uh, to the right control method. Now, let's talk about something we don't have down here yet, but I think it's very important to be aware of, and that's the spotted lanternfly. This is, again, not native to the U.S. It's uh, found first in Pennsylvania in 2014. Right now, it's a very potentially major pest of fruit trees and vines. It's a pretty striking insect. This is uh, the, the nymphs on the left-hand side. You can see they are black, red with white spots. And that's my hand holding an adult on the right. So they're quite large insects. They, they hop pretty well. They fly a little bit. Uh, so far, here is the distribution map for spotted lanternfly. So the blue area is sort of the hot zone, ground zero. Uh, it was found there again in Pennsylvania. So we've got active infestations in Delaware and also the northern part of Virginia, you can see. And the thing that's concerning is look at how many yellow counties there are. This is where they have found adults. So they've either found a single, you know, a live one or, or something they could snuff out or a dead one. But it's moving because it gets everywhere. It crawls everywhere. It flies. We visited the hot zone last uh, August and they warned us, you know, before you get on the bus, brush your pants off. And without fail, every time we did that, there would be lanternflies. We would be brushing off the back of our legs or the creases of our jeans or, or that type of thing. So they really, really do get everywhere. Now, the, they lay the eggs in the fall, as you can see on the left. And this is the, the unfortunate thing is those eggs look like a piece of uh, gray silly putty pressed on the, uh, on the outside of a rock or a stem. So it's very hard to see that they're there. It's very hard to know there's even anything there that you should be watching. They hatch, and at first those nymphs are just black and white, like you see on the bottom. Then they start feeding. They feed on, so far that we know, over 70 host plants. They love uh, all the grapevines. They love uh, pretty much any smooth-barked tree, so all the hardwoods. They like walnut. They like red maple. Um, and then they feed, and then as they get older, they'll develop that red color you see on the right, and then on top, you've got the adults. The adults can be a half inch to three quarters of an inch long, too, so they're, they're quite large. So the good news is they have a strong preference for tree of heaven. So those of you in the invasive species world, you know that these are non-native trees. Uh, but the bad news is that's not all they prefer to feed on, and they will feed on things in such high, high volume that if you look on the uh, right-hand picture there, you can see the stem is all black. That's from sooty mold. Okay, again, we talked about sooty mold with some of those scales. These things, because they're so big and taking in so much fluid, you can actually see the honeydew getting squirted out their back ends. So they produce copious amounts of honeydew. Sooty mold gets everywhere. Uh, we in Pennsylvania, especially, these are a massive, massive problem in urban areas because they will get on people's trees, they will feed, they will be all over the place, like you can see on that picture on the left, just covering things with the sooty mold everywhere. Because it's, you know, based on that sweet nectar or sweet fluid, you get a lot of yellow jackets and wasps. So you've got, you know, they've shown an increased uh, chance of people getting stung in those areas because there's so many more bees there. One thing they have done, and again, this is that picture on the right, they have taken and used Tree of Heaven as a trap tree. So if you've got a, a, an acre of land that's got all sorts of Tree of Heaven, you cut down all but one of them, all these lanternflies are going to go to that Tree of Heaven, and then you can come inject that tree like you would treat for anything, you know, uh, emerald ash borer or something, and you can kill a whole bunch of these. Now, we'll never get rid of these populations at this point, but it is a way to, uh, to help manage them. So one we don't have, but one to please be aware of. So a couple more things. We'll talk about butt and root rots. There's a number of different kinds of what we call butt and root rot. There's Ganoderma, Hinotonus, uh, Armillaria, that type of thing. Most of these you're going to see after the damage is done. 
And these are gonna more often than not take years to kill the tree, okay? And here's a couple instances. So we call button root rot any decay at the base of a living tree. These spores are kind of all over and they're gonna enter through wounds on the tree. So this is a good reason we tell people, please don't wound or injure the base of trees, right? Don't scalp it with the lawnmower. Don't scalp those big roots and don't hit it with the weed eater. Um, really, when you've got these button root rots, prevention is your only control option. Okay, you gotta take good care of that tree. Uh, again, we call it the lawnmower blight. The biggest issue we have with these infected trees is eventually enough of that uh, root and, and you know lower bowl area can deteriorate and you can have breakage and tip over and it makes these things hazard trees. Now again, we mentioned it doesn't usually uh, kill a tree. This is in the town where I live. And if you look, you've got these two trees right on the edge. You see they're pretty big, they're pretty full. They were planted at the same time. And then you see this little little one right here in the middle. Again, planted at the same time. Things to notice there, the foliage is not as thick, the foliage is not as green, and it's a bit shorter than everything. Well, of course, this is actually where we have our farmer's market. I was looking there one day, and lo and behold, you've got conchs, you've got Ganoderma growing on that tree, and it's been growing for uh, last year, was the second year in a row. So I need to go check it uh, once it warms up a little more this year, but, but this is one of those things where there was probably an injury and a Ganoderma got going. And I've had people ask me, well, Ganoderma, is that aggressive? And I've talked to a fair number of people. All the science suggests these things feed on dead tissue, but they don't cause dead tissue. So they're just eating stuff that's already dead. They are not causing the death and mortality. So again, these things are secondary issues. They come in, they feed on the stuff that's already, already hurting. And I'm not gonna talk about palms, that's not really my expertise, but for those of you that do live in palm areas, University of Florida has a great palm program. So they've got a palm problems key uh, right here. We can get that website to you. And uh, honestly, if you've got palm issues, I would go to UF, they're the experts in that. So what can we do overall? We can promote good tree care and silviculture in general, uh, put the right tree on the right side and give it adequate resources. We can minimize damage, both physical and chemical, and you can follow your standard ISA practices. You know, almost all of these things, with the exception of those non-native ones, almost all of these other ones are secondary things. They're coming to a tree that's stressed or damaged. So if you can avoid stress and avoid damage, you will more than likely avoid much of the problems. And with that, uh, everyone, I thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take your questions. And um, the floor is open for questions. I answered everyone's questions as we went. That's amazing. Hey, Paul. We just had to switch. All right. Hey, David, can you hear us? Sure can. Perfect. All right. Yeah, I have to move from my office to Richie's here because I guess I'm having some issues with that mic. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's all right. So, I, so I, I hear that, um, so spotted lanternfly. Can yeah. we train it to just attack the tree of heaven? That's cute. No. No, <laughs> no you know, it's, you know, we were seeing stuff up there. It was killing uh, grapevines just left and right. You know, and we saw a lot of their orchards up there. They're kind of surrounded by little waterways and ravines and that type of thing. And you would see patches of those orchards that were just dead vines. And then you'd look into that ravine and there would be a 60, 70 foot tall, walnut or tree of heaven that had been sucked dry in two years they said 
it was unbelievable wow. how the the sheer number of these things and um, how much fluid they take in uh, just on a you know on each thing you can see it squirting out of there at the back end it's really unbelievable so I don't have any doubt that we'll get it at some point the key is just to try to be ready um, when we do and, and kind of go from there you know so what, what kind of insect is it? Is it a uh, um, Lepidoptera or is it a... Uh, it's, a it's a plant hopper. So it's called oh, a... It's a hopper. Ful yeah, Fulgoridae. It's related to the plant hoppers. It's like a really, really huge plant hopper. Huh. Yes, it looked pretty large. Yeah. Yeah, they're huge. And, and, you know, they don't fly... They're not flying like flies or bees, but they've got a really strong jump. Like they take off and they spring themselves off. And what they do is they always crawl to the, a high point. So the top of a post or a, a light post or up in a tree. And then they jump from there. And a lot of times if they catch the wind right, people have said they've seen them go like hundreds of meters at a time. Just like they get up and hop and catch the wind and they're gone. So they're not going to, you know, migrate long distances, but they can make pretty good, pun intended, leaps here and there. Um, but um, yeah, there the sheer number is really unbelievable up there. I, I didn't believe it till I saw it. So another thing to worry about. Okay, right. we have a question from Michael Abney. Mm, okay, can you describe the process of injecting a tree. Sure can. Yeah. So what we do for injections, uh, there's two different methods. There's a soil injection where they just sort of it looks like a great big, um, you know turkey injector. You stick it in the soil and you punch in whatever amount of chemical. It's usually based on the DBH of the tree. So for every inch DBH, you've got a certain amount of chemical or active ingredient that goes in there. When you're injecting the tree itself, they drill a little hole and it's usually about a quarter inch or so, half inch uh, in diameter. They'll drill it just into the phloem. Uh, so you get basically just to the bark and they go again all the way around the tree. I think it's every three or four inches or something. So the bigger the tree, the more little injection ports. And then they put a little thing in there. It's like a, a port. Um, it, it looks kind of like I'm trying to think if you've got, if you've ever given a kid or a dog eardrops, you've got the cap to the eardropper thing. It looks like that. So you stick it inverted wise, you stick it in there and then they put on all these hoses on the outside that's connected to a big a tank, not a big, I mean, it fits on your back. It's like a backpack tank. And then they use pressure to inject the chemical into all those ports and force it up into that tree's conductive tissues. So that's what they do. So depending on the type of tree, um, some go quicker, some take slower, depending on the, the arrangement of uh, xylem cells and all that. Um, but they're getting to the point now where they inject all this stuff in there and then they can just leave those ports in because they're getting smaller and smaller. And then within a year, the tree is just kind of grown over them and they don't do any damage to the tree. So the ports are getting a lot smaller. They put them in, they set them, push the stuff in and then just walk away. They're sort of self-closing on the back end. So you don't have an open hole in there. And then eventually the bark just covers up where they were. Um, and if it's a tree that's going to get injected, you know, more than one time, they've got a way where they can tell where the ports are. And then when they come back in two years, you know, they know, okay, they start here. They're every four inches. We'll just offset an inch. So they won't, you know, re hit them and, and damage that way. So that's how that works. Yep. Most of that stuff. Now, again, the, the fungal stuff for Laurel wilt, the propiconazole, that's an annual treatment. So basically if you're injecting for fungus, it's annual and it's, it's, I don't know what the cost is. I've just been told it's not cheap. Um, but, if you're doing the stuff for the beetles, you've got two, sometimes three years, depending on how, how lucky you feel, I guess. Um, they, they've said two years, you'll get great control. The third year, if it's low population pressure, it will probably still be fine. But if you have high populations, you probably don't want to wait three years. That's what I've been told. So, and that, that price is coming down more and more. And it's a case for, um, if you've got a, if you're working with a whole community that's in the, the wake of EAB, for instance, and there's a lot of ash trees in there. Dallas Fort Worth is the most recent big urban area that's got EAB. As a community, is again. Em sorry, emerald ash borer, right? What communities should do, or neighborhoods should do, or if you have a HOA, a homeowners association operate as one big unit because you can go to a treatment company and say, we have a hundred houses uh, that need treatment 
and then you could argue on the you can argue you can barter on that price right they may say okay each tree is 50 bucks but if you say well we have 100 houses would you do each tree for 30 from a company standpoint a lot of them will say yes because they are getting such a huge volume they're willing to give you the the cut rate on it so um, we've seen that happen in a, in a number of different places. You know, I, I've got friends in Minneapolis who said, yeah, we did that for our neighborhood and we got almost half off because we had, you know, so many houses at once getting treated. So that's something to remind people. Um, if you're in an area that has that type of situation, see if you can go together, because if you just do it individual by individual by individual, you're not going to get probably as good a deal as if you went in with all your neighbors and, and went together that way. So it's one of those, you know, volume discount things. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Some landscape com supply companies around Atlanta and Athens area sell playground safe wood chips. Understand the chips come from South Georgia. Is this a vector for pests? Um, it would depend on what kind of wood chips you have. Um, more than likely not. The only, the only vector I could think coming in uh, of real concern would be a red bay ambrosia beetle, and I highly doubt they are chipping up bay trees. It's probably pine chips, and there's nothing in South Georgia pine that there isn't here in North Georgia pine. So in all honesty, it's probably not that, not that dangerous in any way, shape, or form. Assuming it's pine. If it's hardwood, um, you know, it, it depends. But I think what they usually use is pine there, if I'm not mistaken. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Just like anything else, we, you know, in the horticulture, um, we emphasize that if you have a healthy plant, um, you'll have far less chance of um, infection uh, or attack from any kind of pest. So, uh, again, it just um, everything you talked about about stress trees is right alongside of what we always uh, recommend, and that is to maintain as much as possible the health of the trees, reduce the stress. Mm -hmm. And in uh, urban areas, um, as you mentioned in the first slide, that is uh, very challenging. Yeah, yeah, it's not a new message. It's just a message we need to keep getting out there that you know those urban trees when you plant them in one of those little four foot by four foot brick containers, it's not like it's growing out on the the back 40, it's, it's got a lot of limitations as to what it can acquire resource wise. And you just gotta be, uh, you know, cognizant of that as you're moving forward. Absolutely. Any other questions from the audience? Well, Dale, uh, David, would you like to talk a little bit about Pro Forest? I can, yeah. So Pro Forest is a group that we have started with the University of Florida, and our whole goal with Pro Forest is to be proactive rather than reactive. So we, we all the time when we get these things in, stuff comes in, like the Emerald Ash Borer, like Laurel Wilt, we find it, and the general response is, wow, that's killing trees. Holy crap, but now what do we do? And we're all always behind the curve when we're always playing catch up. So as Pro Forest, we're trying to work with folks from around the, the Southeast and even beyond to try to figure out what can we do to get ahead of this curve. So we've got some people that, that work in China to try to figure out, well, what is the next big thing possibly gonna be? Uh, we've got folks working with some of the policy people to try to figure out how can we better monitor for these things? How can we you know, do better um, figuring out what's going to happen before it actually gets here so that we're not caught, you know, on the back end of all these things. You know, a lot of people have done the economic studies and preventing something is much, much more cost effective than dealing with it once it's here. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get a coalition of folks together that are interested in that anywhere from the on the ground work all the way up to the policymakers that, you know, in, in Atlanta or, or in DC. So that's, that's our group and that's our goal. And I'd be happy to talk with anyone else uh, more about that if they're interested. Great. Um, a few words, if you would, about uh, possibility of some biological control on at least some of the invasive pests. Sure, sure. Bi so biocontrol, we look at that as the tool in the toolbox. So rarely, rarely will it ever eliminate anything because if you think about it, 
the biological control is another organism that's eating another organism. If, if you ate all of your food, you would starve and die, right? So just by nature, they're not going to consume every single one of whatever they're eating because it would mean their demise. But that said, they can uh, add a nice, uh, you know, extra control method. Uh, we've got a lot of biocontrol work we're doing, especially for emerald ash borer. And we found that, that can reduce the populations up to 30% in some areas. There's some caveats though. So there's got to be a lot of hosts. So somewhere like Georgia or Alabama, where we've got a few emerald ash borers, but it's not really thick like it was up in Ohio and Michigan. Uh, I'm not sure how well the biocontrol is gonna work. because There's gotta be a lot of different host insects out there for the biocontrol agents to find. Um, same with, you know, any type of urban area, there would have to be a lot of ash and a lot of emerald ash borer to make it worth releasing those little wasps. Cause you don't, you know, every little biocontrol wasp you release does not find a beetle. Some of them just don't find one and die. So you're always releasing more than are actually doing something. And that's just kind of the way it works. Um, we're hopeful that some of these populations will take hold and just sort of, become naturalized and, and rolling. And I'm not sure what uh, the status is. They've done a lot of that stuff in places like Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, where they've got those really high ash populations. Um, bio, again, biocontrol, it works to a point. It'll never work all the way, but it's just uh, one component in addition to these other things that can be used. So if we have listeners in, in those areas where I, I mentioned where there's a lot of ash, a lot of emerald ash borer, they might have uh, seen or had some experience with some of the uh, parasitoids as well because they are releasing them quite a bit. And I, I mean, I've always been amazed of how small those wasps are. Yeah, um, they, they attack the eggs. You know, they've got a couple that just attack those teeny little eggs and the eggs are like a millimeter long at most. And you've got a little wasp that's not much, not much larger than that. Um, you know, they look like uh, almost like little teeny gnats. I've got right, a pile of right. them. You can just barely see them in there, but you know, and then the, so I think there's one egg parasitoid, one that goes after eggs, and then they've got three that go after the larvae. So they can get in there and find those larvae. One of them I know they've had problems with because it, they got one from Russia. So it's used to more colder weather. So when they tried it in places like in the more southern areas of EAB, it was too warm for it. So it wasn't working. So there's China figuring out, you know, that one's going to work up in the Northeast and the Lake States, whereas it won't, you know, work down here and that type of thing. So they're figuring out some of that stuff too. It takes a long time to go from finding something in its natural land to being able to release it here. It's been like a 10, 12 year project, just, just getting to that point. So it takes a long time to get biocontrol agents through. And just like you said, um, they're so specific. I mean, not even just for the species itself. It's just like you said, it's one thing for an egg and another three for the larvae. So that's right. a high specificity. And um, that's what's and that's just required, you know, by USDA. They have to do all sorts of host range testing before you can even think about letting this thing out because um you know, they, they did that with a parasitoid fly with the gypsy moth where they let it out, but they didn't, I guess they didn't fully test the host range and it got out and then they discovered it also attacks all these big native silk moths we have, like the big luna moth and cecropia. And so that's been a bit of an issue as well. Um, so they're pretty, pretty stringent on what has to happen before it gets let out. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, any, any questions from the audience before we break? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, David. Um, you really gave us plenty of excellent information and a lot to think about. So watch your trees. Make sure that uh, you give them the best TLC you possibly can, and hopefully that will reduce the incidence of uh, uh, the pests. That's right. That's thanks right. Again. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great talk. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thanks again, David, for that great talk this morning. We're going to go ahead and move into our uh, brief intermission.
We're going to take around five minutes for a break. So if you need to step up and go grab a cup of coffee or run to the restroom, now's the time to do it. And we'll see everyone in five minutes. <laughs> 